you again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I remain as always your humble host, Osgood. You caught me in the middle of some preparations as we're having something of an affair this evening. You see, we've just passed prom season in the neighborhood and each year I like to have a little bit of a soiree for the graduating seniors who are of, how should I say, similar ilk to myself. Welcome them to the weird society, if you will. It can be something of a difficult path to be different in your youth, but eccentricity is its own reward. While I continue with the preparations, why don't you busy yourself with this evening's exhibit, which comes to us from Andrea Martinez Corbin an author and the founder of the speculative Boston reading series. Her stories have appeared in Shimmer, Flash Fiction Online, Podcastle, and more. Her interactive fiction has appeared in Sub-Q, and more projects are available on her website, amcorbin.com. On Twitter, she is at Rosencrantz. This exhibit will be read for us by Ms. Alex Ford. The One in the Night Storm Dress by Andrea Martinez Corbin Narrated by Alex Ford Petra attended her first Death's Ball when she was 16, Younger than most by three years, but her parents conceded in the face of Petra's ceaseless arguments. First, she had pledged to death when she was 14, and been accepted without caveat or hesitation. Second, no one would know who she was behind the traditional mask, so questions of age were moot. Finally, Petra had the perfect outfit, a dress that shimmered indigo violet, tailored to her boxy torso in a way that made her feel both powerful and delicate, like a knife made of damselfly wings. The skirt twirled and draped and gathered like storm clouds, and the sleeves were made of black lace that faded into the air. No one could deny that dress. On the night of her first ball, Petra slicked her hair like crow's feathers, pinned jewels like stars against it, donned a dark mask, and prepared to dance her shoes into dust. A butler at the entrance pinned a white rose to her dress before she could stop him, marking her as a new attendee. Before she could tear the rose away, a woman took her arm and ushered her in, voice gentle and constant, like a susurrus of wind in new leaves. Petra immediately spied death in the crowd. A shimmering, opalescent gown curved over its shapely frame, and its mask was white. No one else would be, could be, in unpainted porcelain. Surrounded by people trying not to look like they surrounded it, death only looked toward the man asking for a dance. This one night... They entertained death, and death would come for no one. Petra always wondered how much truth was in the ball's founding legend, that long, long ago a woman had stopped a plague by inviting death to dance. The woman still spoke. And I won't ask your name, of course. Come, let's treat ourselves to the golden punch. Will you wait for an invitation to dance? The woman turned to look at her, eyes visible behind her painted mask. Her dress was all purples and greens, 
The ensemble suggested the elegance of a peacock without the haughtiness. Do you think it would be long if I waited? Here, of all places, Petra hoped she might be treated as any other young woman. Not plain Petra. Quiet Petra. Uninteresting and forgettable Petra. The woman passed Petra a drink and said, I don't imagine you'll finish your punch. To Petra's shock, it was no exaggeration. Behind her mask's smoky swirls of blacks and blues, she barely took a sip before there came a young man wearing a half-mask, hand extended. She took it. The song was short, and at the end he whispered, Another? How impolite it would be to the other attendees if we monopolized each other's time, Petra said, the words spilling forth more easily than they ever had before. If you're very lucky, you may find me for a tango later. The man laughed low in his throat, pressing his lips to her bare hand. Until then. Petra let herself be swept back to the edge of the dance, only to find another man offering his hand to her. And she danced, until her breath was short and a sheen of sweat rose on her skin, until she was dizzy with masks and colors until she requested, at last, an escort to make sure she made it back to the refreshments. Her partner, a man in a light gold mask, laughed and linked their arms. Soon he placed a full cup in Petra's hand and led her to a table. Sitting next to her golden masked dancer, Petra found herself in conversation with a woman in rainbows, a tall man picking at the tie of his plain blue mask, and a man in a suit so dark he nearly matched Petra. You can't be serious, the rainbow woman was saying. He's flaunting. Let him settle first. Be daring. Find him without the mask later, said Blue Mask. Rainbow laughed. He's certainly not dedicated to anonymity tonight. Who? Petra asked. There's a new pledge of love flitting around tonight. Must be his first event, Rainbow said. She gestured lazily. A man across the way wore a half-mask so pink it was almost obscene, and bowed his way from person to person, handing out roses that he seemed to draw from nowhere. The man in the dark suit raised his chin. I think it's sweet. Not everyone gets accepted by love, after all. Of course not. Love gets nearly as many pledges as life. But life accepts them all. Life isn't choosy. Rainbow said. Life is everywhere, Blue Mask said. So is death, and death accepts only one, Dark Suit countered. Can you imagine pledging to death? Blue Mask shivered theatrically. What would death ask of you? Blue Mask was either being silly or didn't know much about exemplars at all. Petra said, None of them ask anything of their pledges. I heard that wealth takes your youth. A mess of voices responded. That's absurd. Who said that? What would wealth want with youth? Have you known a wealth's pledge? Blue Mask held up his hands in surrender. It's what I heard. Oh, yes, me too. And I heard that death turns you into a pumpkin and brings back your childhood pet as a skeleton, Petra said. The table turned to look at her. Behind her mask, she bit her lip, eyes wide. They burst into laughter, and Petra relaxed. I heard there was a new one recently. It's been long enough, Rainbow said. He didn't even die, that's why it's been so long. Death took him, Blue Mask said. Then, when the table stared at him, dry disbelief nearly audible, he added, I was at the funeral. The casket was empty. Rainbow turned to him for a long, silent moment. You were not. You would have been no more than twelve, and no children were there. Blue Mask crossed his arms and leaned back. Rainbow did the same, her shoulders drawn back, head cocked in challenge. After a long, tense moment, Blue Mask relaxed, 
putting a hand nervously up to the tie of his mask again, and said, Fine. I wasn't. And it was no mystery. He died in his sleep, didn't he? Surrounded by family, I heard. Everyone there to say goodbye? Petra said wistfully. A long, full life, she thought, leaving the world to every person he had loved. In his sleep, yes, Rainbow said, though underneath Petra thought she heard someone laugh. And he's to be credited for our clean water, Petra said. My grandfather said he'd never seen the river so clear in the city. Yes, yes, Dark Suit said, amusement in his voice. But we could argue all night whether his pledge had a bit to do with that. Of course it did. Your pledge defines you. The exemplar touches you. Your life, Petra said. Indeed, my dear, Rainbow said. Petra was mollified, but knew they were humoring her. Not everyone still thought the exemplars meant much in this modern age. The steam engine would be a finer exemplar to them than death or love. Pledging had never been universal, but there was a time when it had been more common, Petra had been told. When these things mattered. When many carried their mark, their token, their pledge to life or hearth or plenty. Petra looked across the room and searched for a white mask. Who's the new pledge to death, then? Dark Suit asked. They haven't presented themselves, Blue Mask said with audible disappointment. That's not unusual for deaths, is it? said Petra's dance partner. It gives us time for sport, Dark Suit said. Have you been to the butchers on Fleet? Oh, that butcher boy, the one with the flop of red hair? Him, don't you think? Petra reveled in their wild guesses, animated and eager and utterly wrong on every count. They never came close to guessing her. For the sheer fun of playing along, Petra suggested a woman she'd taken piano lessons from, citing the smell of death in her home as proof. The smell was a cleaning solvent, dust, and flowers past their prime but laying out the facts lacked the thrill of assigning her falsely to death. Friend, look out! Blue Mask interrupted the guessing, flinging his head toward the dance floor. Your amour is getting away from you. The new pledge of love was dancing extremely closely with a woman. Petra could see Dark Suit's shoulders straighten with the challenge. Best hurry, Rainbow said, more generously than Blue Mask's melodramatic teasing. You don't honestly think he'll fall for you, for all time and eternity, Blue Mask scoffed. Even children know that's not true, Petra said, trying to be as generous with her tone as Rainbow. But she blushed under her mask, thinking of what she had heard about love's pledges. Hushed rumors about the time of your life, even if it was only one night. I'm no fool. But I've never been with a pledge of love, and I, for one, want first-hand knowledge, Dark Suit said, fingers stroking the knot of his tie with exquisite slowness. His attention was halfway across the room long before he bothered to stand up. Wait for me, Rainbow Rose, revealing a skirt of layers and layers of chiffon, moving like clouds of the wildest sunset. I want to steal his dance partner. A moment after the others left, Blue Mask asked Petra for a dance. She looked at him, fidgeting and overdramatic and a little too mocking of sincerity, and declined in favor of refilling her cup. It wouldn't be long, after all. By the refreshments, she shifted her weight, making her skirt swish and swirl. Thank the exemplars for her dance lessons. Thank the exemplars for her mask, and the voice she had found behind it. Paused at the other end of the refreshments table, Death watched the crowd. Petra tried to hold herself as still and regal as Death. She wondered if it were entirely true that exemplars asked nothing, as her drink's chill shivered into her fingers. Hearth was her father's pledge, 
and they seemed to be a family like any other. No difference in their home or meals or anything else. Petra's mother had never pledged. The exemplars unsettled her, and she couldn't bear to be near such strange, inhuman things. Inhuman, Petra thought with a smile. How inhuman could one be at a ball? As she lay in bed after the ball, exhausted and sleepless, images of rainbows and white masks flitting through her head, Petra had a moment of revelation. She would save her dress. A little gift, the most beautiful thing in her life, she would keep for death and wear again at its ball, transforming herself each year in honor of her pledge. The custom among attendees of Death's Ball was to spend months with tailors and dressmakers, creating new looks each year. At Petra's second ball, when the whispers hissed around her, Petra was not surprised. Judgment? Confusion? Curiosity? A copycat? Or the same attendee, faced with the misery of being unable to afford new fashions? Petra's patience settled in her bones and she danced admiring death, dresses, top hats, and all. Her third year, a few attendees realized it was the same woman three years in a row. The one in the night storm dress. The murmur spread as the crowd circled the shining dance floor. At Petra's fourth, fifth, sixth balls, the whispers grew admiring, even jealous. It hadn't been her intention, the acclaim, only a pledge's honor to her exemplar. But to say she minded the flutters of praise would be a dreadful lie. The rest of the year, Petra was a footnote, an average citizen of average means and perhaps below average looks. At death's ball, she was a legend. In the night storm dress, she was charming and a flirt, which only made them clamor more. She was a princess, they said. No, a duchess on the lamb, or better yet, a pauper in a stolen dress. Soon, Petra thought. When the time was right, she'd tell them she was the pledge. When she had done something a tenth as grand as clean water, or when she could give a reason that didn't sound childish. She'd known she was childish even as she pledged years before, but... That made the pledge no less serious. Protecting her family was utterly serious. There had been no one protecting them thus far. Petra grew up watching six different anniversaries her mother quietly kept. Looking at a baby's bonnet that had never been worn. Visiting a small grave early in the morning. Or meticulously cleaning the framed photo of herself and Petra's father with two young boys, taken before Petra was born. Petra had no siblings. She remembered one, faintly, or at least she remembered being prepared for an infant to arrive, but nothing of the infant herself. Petra would tell then, when she had something to say. Petra went to the ball each year and danced. Despite the story that grew around her in those years, one persistent tale was probably untrue. That she danced with death. Perhaps all the way into her bed. Whoever started that rumor was inventive at best, malicious at worst. No. Petra never once asked death to dance. On the night of her tenth death's ball, Petra entered with her dress as darkly gleaming as the day it was made. As she passed her cloak to a butler at the door, she smiled under her mask. At last, at last, the night of the ball, making her heart sing. At last, her dress and her mask. At last, she was nameless and perfect. Petra never responded to the rumors, but that meant she never denied them. 
curating her allure. It was wonderful, for a night, having her pick of dance partners, being wanted blatantly. For as long as a dance, she was royalty in hiding to this person, a trickster to that, more of a mystery than anyone else in their masks. At the end of her first dance, Petra bowed to her partner. When she rose, her eyes rested on death. It wore a dress that was like dawn to Petra's night, pale yellows and rose fading to soft green like dewy grass. It stood smaller than usual, as though younger, looking more like Petra had when she'd pledged than it looked like any of the other attendees at the ball. A mirror. Dawn and night. Calm and storm. The certainty of youth. Petra blinked at death and felt spoken to. She waited two more dances, rested for one, and looked out on the room. The height of attendance, when most everyone had arrived and hardly anyone had left. Petra swept toward the raised stage where the musicians were and caught the first violin before he started another song. After a moment of silent gesturing, he stood and helped her onto the stage. At the lack of music, a murmur crept through the crowd, and then slowly turned to find Petra, waiting. Through the eye holes in her mask, everyone glittered, and death stood out, like always. My dears, my friends, my loves, my fellow celebrants, for years you have wondered who I am. I know the stories. I started a few, Petra said, cocking her hip. The crowd laughed. Tonight, after ten years, I thought you deserve to know why I wear this dress, aside from the fact that it's irresistible. I don't know the last time I lacked for a dance partner. Petra blew a kiss at the crowd, angled like it was for a particular favorite. Her eyes moved from person to person and always darted back to death. It had given her a sign, hadn't it? Underneath that mask, its expression must be urging her on. But she couldn't tell if it even looked at her, or laughed. She had gone too far to doubt herself, and doubting was for Petra, not the one-in-the-night-storm dress. So she said, I wear this dress each year like a sacred uniform, because this ball is sacred to me. This ball is a celebration of my exemplar. Someone screamed in the crowd. Shock? Vindication? Petra couldn't tell. The room burst into chatter and Petra took a deep, long breath of it. All this for her. For death and her, she thought. Petra stepped toward the edge of the raised stage and two people near the front hurried forward, hands at the ready to help her step down. It felt like dancing, floating down the scant distance to land lightly. Their hands lingered and others reached out with shouted invitations, but Petra kept moving. The crowd shifted with her, like her breath was music guiding a new dance one with the sole purpose of bringing Petra to stand in front of death. She had wanted to prove herself first, but perhaps she had gotten things all inverted, mirrored and distorted. It wasn't night and secrets, but still the dawn of her time as a pledge. Petra faced death in silence, the entire ball watching. It was childish to think she could hide and burst out, fully formed and accomplished. They had to grow together. Petra held her hand out, palm up. Behind her mask, she opened her mouth for a breath of air, a short inhale before speaking. The doors burst open. A man stood framed by the darkness outside and cold night air gusted in, carrying the smell of snow. The man tore off his mask to reveal his pale face. 
Death, he said, and everyone looked to Petra and death, but the man wasn't done. There's been a death. The commotion that rose around Petra and death was greater than the one caused by her announcement, as some people scrambled toward the doors and some backed away, as though they could escape the man's words. It couldn't be, she thought, echoing words that were flying around the room. Her hand was still raised in invitation when the man was able to shout over the noise again, calling Petra's name. Her hand shook. He was searching for the Pledge of Death, surely, for some unknowable reason, to demand her presence, her explanation, insist that as Death's Pledge, she would be able to explain all this. But she couldn't move to acknowledge him, until Death walked into the crowd, leaving Petra alone. When she faced the panicked butler, Petra identified herself and clasped his shaking hands. What can I do? Oh, oh my dear girl, the man said. Nothing. I'm so sorry. Your parents' carriage overturned. Petra's ears rang. The rest of the sentence faded. As he spoke, Petra spun around. He grabbed her arm, but she wasn't fleeing. She was looking until she found it, spotted it yards away in the crowd implacable in its mask. The same as all night. The same as always. Petra said nothing more that night, and for days after, in her empty house. The night was crisp, winter late to arrive when the ball came again. As soon as she was safely ensconced in her carriage, Petra leaned back heavily and closed her eyes, focusing on the weight of the porcelain against her face as her carriage wheeled noisily over a long cobblestone drive. When it creaked to a stop, she exited quickly. Music already poured out of the building. Petra paused at the entry to take a breath and gather herself, straighten her spine, tug at her gloves. The ball was grander than ever. The hall gleamed. A larger band played now, now with a singer. A short list of scheduled performances greeted Petra at the door. All of it meant to make up for the year before. More gold, more glamour, more everything for death. More everything, except the one in the nightstorm dress. The governor himself had visited Petra and asked that she not return. Or, for exemplar's sake, only come in true anonymity. Everyone knew the night storm dress was the Pledge of Death, that the pledge was Petra, that Petra had always worn the night storm dress. After the spectacle she had made last year and the turmoil of uncertainty of the last twelve months, Petra was more aware of the crowd than ever. She forced herself to take slow, even steps. She had chosen a purple dress that shimmered with blue in certain lights, which fit her well, but not so well as she'd like. It complemented both her dark mask and her pale violet gloves. The gloves were tight. They had been her mother's, and the stiff fingers would make little difference in dancing. Though there was no logical reason for Petra not to dress as she liked, she had yielded in terms of the dress. But to give up her mask would be to give up herself entirely, and it was one loss beyond what she could bear. She tugged her glove and strode toward refreshments, as though this were a year like any other. You have some nerve. With an exhale, Petra turned. A man in a silky vermilion suit stitched with intricate black designs stared at her, and from the tightness in his voice, she imagined his face was red as well. I was only serving myself some punch, Petra said. If she hadn't yet found her charm again, perhaps it was in the dress after all, then she could be stubbornly obtuse until everyone gave up. The man snatched the empty glass from her hand and said, You'll ruin everything again! Do you want it to take more of us? I don't know what you mean, Petra said, 
reaching for another glass. I remember that damned mask, he said. An audience was gathering, trying not to look like it gathered. Half glances turning into full, a gap like a stage between the crowd and the pair of them. Everyone remembers that mask. What were you thinking wearing it again? That the exemplar would overlook it? Your arrogant narcissism for the past decade was bound to upset the balance we had with the exemplar, even without your haughty display last year. Pardon? Petra said through her teeth. Tension ran through her muscles and nausea rose in her stomach. With great care, she set down the empty glass and turned to fully face the man as he ranted. Your ridiculous speech is the reason the exemplar took them. You are aware of that, aren't you? You disrupted the ball, put yourself at the center where only exemplars belong, and you disrespected... No, you insulted the exemplar. You can say its name. My goodness, are you a child? Death, say it. Petra paused, but the man snapped his mouth shut. She shook her head. Do you know anything about exemplars, or do you just enjoy scolding people without full knowledge of anything in this world? My good sir, if you do insist on berating me, let us at least be on equal ground. Our entire audience knows who I am, but who are you? The man clenched his fist by his side and was silent. It doesn't matter. A woman in the crowd, though Petra couldn't tell who. He's right. You ruined the purpose of the ball and death punished you. Do you think the governor would allow the ball to continue if it were so easily ruined? If that were its fragile purpose? Petra turned so she spoke to all, not just the man who had confronted her. The purpose of this ball is not to trick death into revelry in order to prevent its work. How could it? Death itself doesn't cause the cessation of life any more than life causes two people to create a third. But there never was a death during a ball before, another woman called out. Wasn't there? How far back did we take note? And how many times was there a death early the next morning? How many times did someone choose to say nothing until dawn? Even if there had truly been no deaths, it would mean nothing. Only that we had all fooled ourselves into seeing fate where only coincidence lives, Petra said. A moment of silence. Only the band playing on, and Petra exhaled, looked down at her gloves, her mother's gloves, and repeated, All of us fooled. You think you know death? the second woman asked. She'd come to the front of the crowd, short and stout and beautiful in a dress like a sparrow. Her voice was not harsh, only curious. If she was the only one in the crowd not blaming Petra... That was enough. Petra focused on her. I know that death was here when my parents died. And I believe that death was there, too, at the carriage accident. If death could only be one place at once, what a poor exemplar it would be, Petra said. Death comes when the breath leaves the body, but death does not steal that air. I'm sure we're all reassured, hearing that from the pledge who death punished, the man said. Exemplars do not... Petra started to make the same points again, but the crowd was breaking up. You don't know a thing, the men in Vermilion said. You'd be better off renouncing your pledge. She just needs time to learn better, said the sparrow dress woman, turning away. She clearly hasn't even considered that it's likely an actor under that white mask each year. Actors would talk, Petra called out, but the woman waved her hand, like she was scattering Petra's words into the air. For the next hour, no one approached to ask her to dance, but she was certain they spoke about her. As she waited, Petra seemed to merit hardly even a glance, and the anxiety that her dress used to banish bubbled up in her chest, filling her lungs. It had been foolish to return, foolish to wear the mask, foolish to argue. She should have stayed home as the governor asked. Petra sipped pale champagne punch through a straw under her mask, grateful for the placidity of the porcelain. 
she stared down at her gloves. A pressure like a stone weighed on her chest, crushing breath from her lungs. It was impossible to ask for a dance. Too much time had passed. Whenever she gathered the courage to abandon the ball, she would return to a silent, empty home, her shoes unscuffed by clumsy partners, her gown as pressed and clean as when she donned it. Perhaps it was better to be death's pledge, alone in the house of the dead. Perhaps the man was right and she had ruined it. Or woman was right, and it was an actor every year, play-acting in death's place. Or both. Both the actor mocking her beliefs and death knowing her disrespect. Oh, best to give up and go home. A hand extended before Petra, gloved in white. A crisp sleeve and cufflinks with shining mother-of-pearl inlay. Petra looked up to see a white mask. Death wore a dress suit, sleek jacket with tails over the white vest and shirt, all fitted ambiguously and perfectly. Death was ever death, yet had changing form. This year it was not male, not female, but a vision nonetheless in white tie. This was her moment. Petra took Death's hand. The music seemed to take a breath, every instrument skipping a note as Petra rose. For an eternity and a heartbeat, they stood posed, not moving to the dance floor. Petra's hand rested in Death's and they gazed at each other, one placid mask to the other. Young and naive, Petra had chosen death for her loyalty with a secret hope in her heart, now fractured. At each ball, Petra waited, never once approaching the object of her loyalty, watching while every attendee asked it for a dance. That was the order of things. For one night, death waited for an invitation. And then, death came to Petra. She gripped its hand with a sudden ferocity, feeling bones under skin, its fingers contorting, but Death didn't try to pull away, so Petra drew it forward. Petra knew her chest and neck were flushed, could feel the heat of her skin. You couldn't have waited until morning, she hissed. Death moved its arm and drew Petra closer, inexorably into its arms. For me, she said voice drier than her eyes, which stung. A few hours, that's all. Then it would have nothing to do with this night. Nothing to do, separate from, from you. On the dance floor, couples parted to allow them to glide wherever death wished. Petra had never been so close to death. It was as warm and graceful as any dance partner. When her parents died, She'd been making a fool of herself while death stayed at arm's length. Did they see you? Were you there? She asked. As the song ended, death continued to lead Petra and the band took up a melody from their steps. Are you even real? She whispered. Petra stared up at the white mask. There were no eye holes. The music sounded raucous to her ears, too loud for her thoughts. Her mask captured her breath and held it close, foggy and stifling, making her want to rip it off for the first time in her life. Instead, she lifted her hand from Death's shoulder, in that moment blood singing with a new desire that beat from her broken heart, thrumming with the petty need to unmask a monster for all to see, burning with a grief that would never leave her. She was dizzy with anticipation of a new roar from the crowd. Whether they would look to her as the one who finally showed death for what it really was, or as the pledge who kept destroying the ball out of selfishness, her head spun like she'd stopped drawing breath. But she was braced upright in death's arms. And Petra reached for its mask. 
As her fingers grasped toward the ribbon, they fought against the tight fabric of her gloves and she hesitated. Strange, inhuman things. What mortal nonsense all of this was. The shame and vanity. The idea of revenge. The glamour and the shine. Petra's skin prickled. The suit could be empty for all it mattered to the ball or her pledge. Her arm ached from hovering above Death's shoulder. And in the corner of her eye, she saw how still the dancers were. How those who moved were out of time with the music, with so much focus once again on Petra and Death. Petra untied the ribbon of her mask and tossed it to the floor, where it cracked in two. She lost track of it as death swept her away in a waltz. <laughs> wow. No one ever said growing up was easy. When our narrator Alex Ford isn't rocking around the nation in her band for theatre reunion, she's holed up in her guest room following a different passion, recording audiobooks and editing manuscripts. Perhaps she'd like a gig here. An avid reader and writer, she delights in helping people bring their creativity to life. You can check out her exploits, mystery bruises, and a most handsome cat on Facebook or Instagram. Well, I do believe my guests will be arriving shortly, so I hope you do not mind if I send you on your way now. Be sure to visit us next time at the Gallery of curiosity. Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution, no derivatives license. All story copyrights remain with the authors. Our theme song is Ashes, Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. If you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends, leave stars and reviews online, and take comfort in the knowledge that the truly cool kids blossom well after high school is over. This episode was produced in July of 2019. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. No, no, my dear, that is a fish fork. And in odd society, we place our coffee spoons on the top of the saucer, not under the handle and to the right. If anyone questions you, you know what to do. Yes, that's right. Full gaze, direct eye contact, slow blink. Excellent. Now, do pay attention. Oh, yes. A hand on the other person's hand will make the situation much more uncomfortable. Well done. Good improv. Now, do pay attention to the order in which the silver is placed. On the left, we have the melon ball scooper. Those are strictly for eyeballs and only for your guests. Thank you.